Hi, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. Okay, welcome to episode 30. So I said episode 30 was going to be a special, and it is. This is a different kind of episode for me. This is a real departure in terms of storytelling. This is something that I really wanted to do and um, I've spent a long, long time working on it and I really hope that you like what you're going to hear. This story isn't true crime, but it's still extraordinary. It's still a story that I know when you hear it, you're going to love it as much as I do. This is the story of Ed Hawkins. Okay, let's go. All right, so just to talk about before we start, how did this come about? So I have the Facebook group. There's the Facebook page. And, you know, as people joined one by one, I pay attention to who joins. I pay attention to who's posting in the group, who's saying what. And I started to notice a man called Ed Hawkins popping up on the group. And I thought, who's this guy? What's he about? What's his sort of story? So, you know, I was seeing the sort of things he was posting and I thought, oh, he's posting some stuff that I think is quite interesting. And he was sort of replying to comments and he was sending messages and I thought, hmm, something interesting here. Do you know that feeling when you just get, I know that there's a story here. I know that there was something with Ed that I knew I just wanted a little bit more information about. So, I approached Ed not knowing anything, if I'm honest with you. Not really knowing anything. And I said to Ed, tell me your story. I just want to know your story. Now, bear in mind, I knew nothing at this point. But my gut feeling, my gut was telling me, there's something there, there's something to be told. He got back to me and he said, you're not the first person who's ever said to me that I should tell my life story. A former boss had once suggested to Ed that he should tell his story and share it with people. So I said to Ed, okay, here's how it's going to go. I'm going to send you some questions And I just want you to answer them. Be as honest as you want to be. And he said, okay, I will. He was generous. He was open to the process. I said, at any point, Ed, you can protect yourself. And he said, no, I won't. So I'm sitting here doing this episode and I'm surrounded by nearly 60 sheets of paper And they have notes. They have questions. I've scribbled over everything. I've got pictures that Ed has sent me of him, his family. And even even as I'm about to record this episode, I can see that there's a Facebook notification that he's posted on my timeline. I can't thank Ed enough for his honesty during this process. And I hope that you will enjoy the story of Ed Hawkins. Ed is 70 years old. He lives in Washington, D.C. He lives with the woman he married in 1978 called Benny. He never refers to her as his wife. He calls her either Benny or the girl's mother. In the house they live in are two of their grown-up daughters and one grandchild and four dogs. Lucky, Baxter, Tucker 
and the beautiful Gus. Gus is gorgeous. Gus is just the most beautiful dog. Ed shares pictures of Gus with me because he's just beautiful. So, five humans, four dogs. It's a busy house. Ed and Benny have four daughters in total. Ed is gay. His Facebook description of himself is that he's a 70-year-old gay geezer. Ed spent his young life training to be a priest. Ed felt the impact of the death of Martin Luther King at close range. Ed has lived and his story is worth telling. Okay, so as Ed is writing to me, he is in the TV room of his house. He is typing on his laptop while Benny watches a TV series from Australia called Newton's Law. Three of the dogs are lounging around. Benny says to Ed, what are you typing? And he says he's writing his autobiography. She gives him a silly look and that is that. Henry Edward Hawkins was born on the 8th of January, 1947. His parents weren't married, but both were living in Washington, D.C. Ed's father had been in the Army Air Corps in England, France and Germany in 1944 and 45. Ed's dad had returned home in late 1945. Now, Ed's mother, she had escaped a pretty awful home life in uh, Pennsylvania by joining the Waves and that was the Navy's female service distinction. So she and her sister, they had a deal by which they would always be stationed together. They were still living together when Ed's dad came home from the war. One thing led to another and Ed's life began. Now although he was conceived in April, and he tells me almost certainly in DC, they didn't get married until the September of that year, 1946. Ed's mother had a very difficult pregnancy with Ed. She had to be in bed from the beginning of October until he was born. That's a long time to be in bed, my God. That's a long time. Her labour was really difficult and taking after his dad he had a really large head this kind of made me laugh when he told me this she had a really large head his mother had a relatively small birth canal the obstetrician to speed things up pulled him out with forceps in ed's own words he says my head right after birth was elongated Apparently something like the head of the figure in the painting, The Scream. (laughs) No, the one I mean. Yeah, it's funny. I stayed in the hospital with mum for about a week. And like Jesus, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Ed has one sibling, his older brother, Bob. School. Ed says, I loved school. I was skipped ahead from first grade to second grade. I'm not sure why. I was a good student. I had lots of friends, mostly girls. The boys I had as friends all seemed to be the bad boy sort. My first good male friend at school was a boy named Larry Bureau. We did everything together, but he was always getting into trouble. And sometimes I would get into trouble with him. My problem was that I couldn't shut up in class. (laughs) The punishment for talking in class was that the talker had to sit on the floor under the table at which everyone was seated, maybe six or seven people. I sat under the table for what seemed like 25% of my time in second grade. (laughs) What a strange punishment to have to sit under the table. I was very outgoing and sociable until the sixth grade. Ed continues, by the time I was in the sixth grade in a Catholic school, I must have been totally gay in attitude and behaviour. By that time, I was very familiar with the words 
faggot, fairy and sissy. One afternoon in sixth grade, I was walking from school to the bus stop about three blocks away. From behind a bush in someone's yard, two of my classmates came out and they dragged me into a yard. One of them got on my chest and told me that if I didn't stop being a fairy, he and his buddy, they would take their knives, which they were waving around, and they would make my face not be pretty anymore. I told my mum about this later that night. She said she thought I was pretty much a sissy, and that it would be safer for me to act like all the other boys. This incident did a lot to end my extroverted days at school. Ed says, I didn't return to my normal self, more or less, until I was a freshman in college. I decided I wanted to be a priest when I was about five or six years old. I loved going to church. And the priest was the guy who had the best part to play in the mysterious doings at the altar. He used a special language. He wore beautiful robes. He had gestures and body movements that seemed otherworldly. It was during Mass one day that Ed decided he wanted to play the organ. The booming sounds it made, especially the bass sounds, they transfixed him. Now, Ed's dad was raised a Southern Baptist. He never went to church, except later on, down the road, when we'll see how much the church comes to play a part in Ed's life. That was really the only time that Ed's dad ever took to do with it. Then he would come and see what was happening. Ed's mum was raised Catholic by her stepmother, but her stepmother was a superstitious German woman who saw God as an angry old man. So Ed had reached the age of 13. And what he wanted, what he really wanted, was to go to the seminary. But he was too afraid to ask his parents. Ed had checked out a number of religious orders and he'd sort of settled on the Dominicans because he liked the Dominicans' habit. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> he liked the habit. He liked the costume. He was enjoying the outfit. Ed was sure that he knew what he wanted to do. He was sure that pursuing religion was the best way for him to proceed in his life, but he was too afraid to ask his parents. So Ed wound up going to a public high school and it was there that he met Bill McConville. So they were both on the academic track and they were in the advanced group and they became friends. Bill also wanted to be a priest and Bill's parents, they were completely supportive of that desire. Not only did he want to go to the seminary, he was in the process of being admitted to St. Joseph's Seminary in Calicoon, New York. Now, Bill, at this time, he knew how much Ed wanted to become a priest. And he suggested to Ed one day, in January 1961, that maybe Ed should come along with him come along with him to the Calicum. Ed says, having him on my side gave me the courage to ask mum if I could go away. She thought about it for a few days and finally said it was okay with her if dad said it was okay. He says the problem with that is that I couldn't bring myself to ask dad. I was too afraid of him. His mum, she agreed that she would ask. His dad, she did. And she said, dad seems to be okay with the idea, but that he wanted Ed to go to him and ask him himself. 
So knowing that he was likely to say okay, and knowing that he wouldn't get angry, Ed asked him, and he said yeah, okay. So he applied, and he was accepted, after several interviews with priests, physicians, and psychologists. In September 1961, Ed's mum, dad, and brother, they drove him the 200-mile journey to Calicoon, and it began one of the best times of Ed's life. So I said to you that during this process I had asked Ed lots of questions. I asked Ed, what are you obsessed with? And he answered, God, my daughters and my past men. Ed has four daughters. Sarah is the eldest and she's divorced. She's a nurse who works in an emergency room. She is a brilliant and a well-respected nurse. She lives with Ed and Benny, along with her only grandchild, Casey. Rebecca is the second oldest daughter and she lives in Alexandria, Virginia. She has a degree in English and she is an amazing writer. She works for a company with offices all over the world. Ed and Benny, they have twins. They have Annie and Benny Marie. Benny Marie has a really successful career as an academic administrator and she's been doing that for about eight years. But recently she decided she wants to get her degree in nursing, like her eldest sister, Sarah. So she lives also in the house with Ed and Benny. The second twin, Anna Marie, whom Ed calls Annie, is married, but she keeps her maiden name. She and her husband, Jared, they live in Richmond, Virginia. Annie has an undergraduate degree in anthropology and a master's degree in special education. She teaches autistic children at a school in Richmond. So Ed is deep in his studies. He says, over the next five years, my classmates and I, we studied Latin lots of Latin. We had classes in theology. We studied English, Greek, French, German, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, calculus, physics, history, public speaking and music. I can't put into words how much I loved what I studied there. During this time he learned to play the organ and he became the class organist. He was a member of the choir. He learned to play and learned to love soccer and volleyball. He wrote for the school paper and the school magazine. He was in the school plays. Each student, they had jobs to do. Ed started out by cleaning the toilets. And of this, he says, this is the most disgusting job I've ever had. Men are slobs. (laughs) He moved on to become a barber. For a year... He was a bell ringer. They had an electric bell. That was the only one used in the morning to get everyone up. The rest of the time, the bells to signal the start of prayers, the beginning and ends of classes, mealtime, lights out, were rung by hand. And for a year, that's what Ed did. His classmates, over time, became like brothers. And they all went through the same challenging experiences. Ed says, for the most part, my classmates were buddies, not sexual objects. Over the years, we've all grown apart, but we stay in touch by email, we have Facebook, and every few years, we have a reunion. I still miss the camaraderie we had as kids. Ed had two 
major crushes on guys during his time at Calicoon. Neither one involved sexual activity. The first of these prompted him to come out for the first time to his spiritual director. He told him outright, I think I'm a homosexual. His spiritual director said, nonsense. He told Ed he wore his heart on his sleeve and that everybody has close relationships and that he should just stop worrying. Ed writes, I wanted to believe him, so I did. And I went on through the rest of my time there without worrying a lot about my sexuality. Ed's class graduated from Calicoon on May 30th, 1966. As Ed is writing this next part, he's in his backyard, in the shade, on a cool autumn afternoon. All of the four pups are running around. Gershwin's An American in Paris is coming through his earbuds as he starts to write. I ask Ed, what scares you? He says, less now than in my earlier life, but still plenty. Mostly what will happen as I get older. I'm not afraid of death. My mum was here. And I took care of her during the last three months of her life. She died of a form of lung cancer caused by exposure to asbestos. Benny was finishing chemotherapy for breast cancer at the time. So I took care of mum by myself. It was one of the greatest privileges of my life. Having gone through that with mum. I am afraid of disease but I'm not afraid of dying. Ed tells me about a time when he was three or four years old. He's in his parents' living room. He's with his mum, his dad, his uncles, his aunts. So there's a popular TV host on Saturday Night TV and he had some hula dancers performing and they had ukuleles. So Ed gets up to dance along with the women on TV. So he was very flamboyant. So he was four years old. He was having so much fun. So he's dancing along to this thing on TV. And he was just giving everyone a really good show at this point. Everyone in the living room, they are loving this. They're, ha- they're really enjoying Ed dancing along with these hula women on TV, except for one person in that living room, Ed's dad. Ed said, I looked over at him and he gave me the meanest, darkest look I can ever remember having to that point. I knew he wanted me to stop And I did. In Ed's words, both my mother and my brother agree that dad hated me when I was a kid. I'm sure as they were that the reason was that dad knew I was gay. He was brutal in his punishments of me. He would use his leather belt and spank me for anything he thought was an infraction. Worse, than the spanking itself was the anticipation of the spanking. I remember once knowing that dad was going to spank me for several hours before he came home and I was catatonic with anxiety. He got home, he took me to his room, pulled down my pants and he went to town. As soon as he started, I began to piss and I pissed all over him. He didn't even mention the piss. Another time, he went at me especially hard and he even got into parts of my back. I literally could not sit down. I had to lie on my bed on my stomach. After he'd gone to sleep, 
my mum came in and she took me into the bathroom to check me. She put some salve on my back and my ass and she didn't say anything about the whipping. She told me to stay home from school the next day and I did. Ed tells me that often his grandmother would tell him in private that he was her favourite grandchild and that she loved it when he danced. Sometimes she would just put music on the radio and Ed would start dancing and she would watch him. And there was a time, this is oh, just such a lovely, such a, a lovely thing. There was a time when she had friends over in the house and she brought out a table and she put Ed on the table. He was really young at this point and she asked him if if he would dance for all the people and he did and he loved it and everyone loved just watching him dance on this table. The night that happened, Ed's father and his grandmother had harsh words in her kitchen and Ed is sure that his dancing was the reason. Okay, so in the process of going through Ed's story, an email arrives and this email comes from one of Ed's friends. So Ed had told one of his friends that he was writing his story for a podcast and he says to him, is it okay if I just send you the things that I've written so far that I've sent to this guy, Barry, who's doing the podcast. So, with with Ed's permission, I'm going to read you the reply that the friend sent. And it's this. It starts, Bro, I read over the answers you sent. How well do you know this guy? You've got to be careful. Assuming you trust him, and that your trust is well placed, then give him the story you want to tell. And I'm not really sure what that would be. There is so much shit to choose from. Where are all the fun things you did? There's no mention of Colorado Beach. I remember your mum telling me how much you enjoyed those trips to your aunties, and you never mentioned them. What you've written so far sounds like the bio of a serial killer. (laughs) I defer to Benny on the marriage thing. Please don't get into the sex part. And if you do, write about Father Ben. I'm worried it's just going to be another downer like your childhood. Do you have to be so thorough? If I were writing my life story, it would be a page and a half total life story. Remember what we talked about last year. Our age is synthesis, it's not exploration. If you do this, if you reply to this guy on this podcast, try to show what you've learned and how you've grown. Not just put down your individual horrors without showing your victory. If you forward this to this guy, Barry, and I know that you will, please delete the parts about Ross, Eric, and Bill. I'll remember you, Ed, in my mass this morning. Please keep praying for me. Did this email stop Ed in his tracks? Did it fuck? Ed fearlessly just kept on answering the questions. Novitiate, American Novitiate. Novitiate, American Novitiate. So Ed has entered the Novitiate and he says, the Novitiate in those days was a period of a year and a day of total seclusion. There was little talking, chanting of the Divine Office seven times a day in Latin, silent meditation, kneeling in the chapel for two hours, and some work. Ed was again 
class librarian and the class organist. He says the silence, the lack of TV, radio, newspapers, regular conversation or even fiction focused all of my energy on my navel. It was an amazing year. It was both good and bad. I learned how to pray. I developed an intense love of Jesus. I learned the differences between emotion and commitment. I examined my motives for being where I was more honestly than I ever had before. He says, I came to appreciate and love the gospel of the Franciscan way of life. I also found that there was absolutely no avoiding the truth about myself. I am a gay man. I try to assimilate this truth by myself in prayer and self-discipline. Those things didn't work. I spoke to the assistant novice, Master Edwin. I told him how I felt. And I told him I knew why I was gay. He told me I was too young to know who I was and that I should keep asking the Lord for guidance. He asked me... (laughs) This sort of makes me laugh. He asked me, when you go to a movie, who do you like to look at? The leading lady or the leading man? So Ed says by this time I'd figured, what the hell, I'll tell him what he wants to hear. The leading lady. And that, of course, was a lie. A few months later, Ed is back in crisis mode. So... He went to the novice, Master Theophane. Ed tells him everything. Unlike the first friar that he'd gone to, Friar Theophane, he takes Ed seriously. He asks a lot of questions. After two hours, during which time Ed is convinced he's going to be kicked out of the order, Friar Theophane said that he would arrange for a friar who was also a psychiatrist to come and talk with Ed. He never told Ed when he would come and so for six weeks Ed waited. He waited and he waited for this conversation. Eventually the day came. Ed went over it all again and the guy just sat and he listened. And at the end, when Ed had completely spilled his guts and he was on the verge of tears from tension, he said, What do you want to do about it? He said to Ed, Staying or leaving is your decision. But I'm pretty sure, after time, you're going to want to leave. Ed was relieved. He says, I felt like I was going to pass out. After that night, he was called to the office and he was asked to talk about what had the priest stroke shrink said. Ed told them everything except for the sooner or later part. But he was also told, you shouldn't worry about any of your concerns. Instead, you should devote yourself entirely to the business of becoming holy. And in Ed's writing, he's put in brackets, fuck me, with about 20 exclamation marks. Because I can imagine that's how you must have felt at that moment. So Ed finished the novitiate pretty much at peace. Well, at least on a conscious level on July 15th, 1967. He made his three-year vow of poverty, chastity and obedience. And he left New Jersey for Catholic University in Washington, D.C. He was going home in a way. This was not far from where his parents live. 
From here, Catholic University awaits Ed. When I ask him about it, he says, I was overwhelmed at first at Catholic University. There were all kinds of people in my class, members of other kinds of religious orders. The members of my class, we started to come together. We got close and we watched out for one another. If I wasn't praying enough, someone mentioned it to me. When I gained weight because of lack of exercise, one of the guys made me go jogging with him every afternoon. In April of 1968, during Ed's studies, Martin Luther King was assassinated. The riots in DC were horrible. Ed could stand on the roof of the Friday and he could see the National Guard troops patrolling the shopping district. Ed volunteered when they asked for people to collect clothes from the various churches in DC and take them to the central distribution point in Maryland, just outside of the DC border. So they had a small bus, there was about eight of them, climbed into it and they they were going to go about and get these clothes. And at one point they're driving through the southeast of DC, the poorest area, when all of a sudden the driver shouts duck. And they have no idea why. Why is the driver shouting duck all of a sudden? And they realise there's actually men with guns around the bus. And in that moment they realise shots had been fired into the bus. Luckily, no one was injured. Luckily, Ed survived that experience. Fucking hell. So it was during this time that Ed had begun to feel a sexual attraction to one of the guys. The guy named Joe. Joe is now the grandfather of lots of kids. Ed felt like Joe maybe liked him too and Ed says he would get a hard on whenever Joe was near one night they went out drinking and not being used to alcohol at that point Ed ended up being sick all over a bathroom floor and Joe offered to clean it up and help Ed into bed nothing ever really happened between them In 1969, Joe married a woman and lives happily now with her. In the summer of 1968, Ed and his friend Bobby Menard, they volunteered to spend two months of their missions in the southern states working with the poor people. The first two weeks were in Atlanta, Georgia. There were a few poor people but mainly it was middle class so as Bobby and Ed are on their mission Bobby Kennedy was shot and they helped with the funeral mass that the parish celebrated for him now the pastor he wanted them to go door to door in the projects and invite lapsed Catholics back to mass Ed says this was an entirely African-American part of town and it was very, very poor. So they're going around on this job and they decide to wear their habits and they're going into really, really sort of dicey, dark areas. I mean, they're wearing their habits even though that hadn't stopped them being shot at in DC. So they would spend a whole day going from one apartment to the next some homes were very welcoming and they would offer them everything under the sun they were so hospitable they would give them iced tea they would give them whiskey they would give them whatever they could give them ed would pray with anyone who would allow it before they left the apartment after two weeks in atlanta they went for six weeks to Anderson, Southern Carolina. Anderson is where, as Ed puts it, I saw what being poor is like. He says, everybody, it seemed, wanted to have us for dinner. We were there for six weeks. 
and we never had dinner in our own house. We always ate at the invitation of one of the parishioners in their own homes. And it was always chicken that we were served. These people had nothing, yet they insisted on us having dinner. I've never felt so humbled in my life before or after those six weeks. Ed says, one of the homes to which we were invited had dirt floors. But the people were kind, full of humour and very loving towards us. In one home, they had a piano. It was horribly out of tune. But the lady of the house, having seen that I could play the organ, she asked me to play so that they could sing along. The only songs that I knew by heart were hymns. But I know a lot of hymns. So for more than an hour, we sang one hymn after another. With them in South Carolina was a friar from the class ahead called Brother Evan. Ed says Evan was a great guy. All the way down and all the way back, I poured out my gay story to Evan. He told me he'd always suspected I was gay. He asked me why I was so hung up on the issue. I told him of all the times that I had sought advice and of all the advice that they had given me. I told him finally that what I needed was for somebody, somebody in authority, to tell me that it was okay that I was gay, that they wanted me as a friar anyway. Evan told me, very simply, that's a thing that will never happen. I told him, the more and the more I was thinking about leaving, because I was just so fucking exhausted of trying to live with this bullshit. When Ed got back to DC, he spent a week with his parents. He told them he wanted to leave. He didn't tell them the real reason why, but he told them he'd had enough. This is not what he wanted to do anymore. His mum said, fine. She had always told him that he could leave whenever he wanted and that she would support that. What ascended Ed was his dad. His dad said to him that he wanted him to stay for another year and just think about it. Ed told his dad that he was sure being a priest was not the right thing for him. And his dad said, I'm sure that that is the thing that you were meant to do. Ed told his dad that he'd thought about it long and hard And that in order to avoid a complete breakdown, he needed to get out of there. His dad said, sure. And he offered to pay for graduate school. So Ed went back to the Friday and he told the Master of Clerics that he wanted to leave and why and the date was set. One of the priests came to Ed and he said to him, You've made the right decision. Another priest came to him and pleaded that Ed wouldn't go. Ed was the first person in his class to leave after taking the vows. 
After Ed, one by one, they started to leave. All but three of the 25 friars who took the vows left. When he left the friars, he stopped going to church. Ed says, I had had enough. So in amongst everything that Ed sends me, there's a really beautiful photograph. And it's a photograph of his family. And they're standing outside of the Novitiate in July 1966. So Ed is wearing his robes. His father is in a suit. His brother Bob is wearing a checked suit. And his mother, oh, she looks amazing. She's wearing a white dress with a matching hat. In the photo, Ed and his mother, they're looking at the camera and his dad and his brother are looking at each other. It's one of these kind of, it's not staged, it's not, it just, it's just got a really beautiful kind of just, it's a, just a moment, just a moment in time has been captured in this picture. It's gorgeous. Ed says this is the only family photo of them all together that he can find. As Ed writes this next part, he is in the dog park with his dogs running around. He's on his laptop and his earphones are plugged in. Having left the path of what Ed thought his life was going to be, what happens next? He went on to graduate school to study German. He spent several months living in a German town. And when he returned, he continued the rest of his working life. As I'm going through this process, I get yet another email. And this time, it's Ed directly. It's not a, It's not his friend <laughs> saying, watch out for the scary podcast man who's trying to steal your soul. It's, it's Ed himself. And he says this to me. Barry, I've been thinking. I don't think you knew what you were in for when you asked a 70-year-old man who's had a complicated life to give you his story. I've thought several times that you must have more information than you can possibly reduce to a coherent story for your podcast. But I also know you're an excellent storyteller, so I know you can do it. You've mentioned that this is a challenge for you. I believe that. So I'm going to say drop this. Get someone younger with a less complicated and a much shorter life to profile. Ed at this point offers me three options, three get out options. And he finishes by saying, I feel a bit guilty about this. I'm pretty sure you've had no idea when you asked me to work with you exactly the kind of complicated life that I have lived, Ed. I tell Ed to forget it. I say to him, Ed, I'm doing the episode as I said I would. And he replies, I've been told that Scottish men are extremely stubborn and I can now say that's true. On Holy Saturday, 1975, Ed was visiting his parents and they had a neighbour called Claire. Claire was at the house having dinner and she asked Ed if he would like to join her at the Easter vigil she was planning to attend. She told him it was being led by the most dynamic of men, Father Ben. So Claire and Ed off they go to the vigil. So he meets Father Ben, and they instantly connect. Ed would end up going on holiday with Father Ben and the neighbour, Claire, for a month in California. On that holiday, there were two other women. One of those women would become Ed's wife. A young divorcee from San Pedro, California, a convert to Catholicism named Benny 
Lewis. I'm going to interrupt now as well and say, at this point, I am deep into this process and I'm becoming concerned. It is a big responsibility when someone hands you their story. And I start to worry. I ask Ed, are you sure that everything that you've told me you want included? I say to him, do you want to read this all before I record it? He emails me to say, and I quote, (laughs) If you can make a story out of the shit I have sent you, then you deserve a Nobel Prize in fucking literature. (laughs) I ask Ed, who's the biggest love of your life? And he says, Benny is the most public and longest love of my life. She is my best friend. And she has been since 1976 in California. I cannot bullshit her. She knows me better than I know myself. We haven't had sex in over 30 years and she knows that sex will never happen. I hated having sex with her. Not because it was Benny, but because Benny is female. I hated bedtime in those days because I was afraid I would have to perform. After we had the twins, Benny declared that would be the last time she ever got pregnant and I breathed a sigh of relief. Sex still happened, but only when she got upset about its lack. Benny is a friend I could never call our relationship romantic In the usual sense. During this, I ask Ed, what are your passions other than politics? He says crochet, music of all kinds, movies, mystery novels, history and of course, podcasts. So during this process, I think about a lot of things. I mean, I think deeply about the relationships that I have around me. I I think about the fact that my grandmother always told me that I was her favourite and the fact that my partner is the exact same. He was his grandmother's favourite. What is that? I think about freedom. I think about freedom in the sense of personal freedom, political freedom. I think about the part that religion played in Ed's life so I mean this is letting you into a little uh, podcast secret but um, I have I have a bouncy ball as ridiculous as that sounds because it's something a child has but I have a bouncy ball and whenever I'm trying to really work something out what I do is just kind of walk up and down like any space that I can find and I bounce this ball over and over and over and over again I've had this exact same ball for about (laughs) 10 years Um, I just bounce this ball over and over and over when I'm trying to work something out I I think I have bounced this ball more times than I ever have just trying to process Ed's story and just work out what is it I'm actually trying to trying to say and I start to I think I started to think about narrative. I started to think about how do we tell our own story? How the fuck does anybody ever, when you say to someone, because I asked such a big question, how do you tell your story? And at which point, you're you're always going to be the narrator of your own story. So therefore, you can edit, you can choose. It's always going to be your perspective. So, yeah, so, so many bounces of that ball so many things to think about so during this I I reach out to Ed and I say is there anything you've sent me you just want me to edit out right now I'll just I'll take anything out that you that you don't really want people to know and he says no so after leaving the seminary within a few weeks Ed got his draft and it was the Vietnam War Ed says, I was determined that if I was too gay to be a friar, I was fucking too gay to be 
a soldier. <laughs> I love that. Ed had to go and see a shrink because they wanted evidence of his gayness. God. Oh, the draft board actually wanted evidence of his gayness. So at that session, the shrink asked him about his fantasies, his sex dreams, his relationship with his parents. And eventually he was told, well, yeah, you are gay, but you're young. And I'm pretty sure if you were just to get married, that would clear all of that up. So during the time that he was getting to know Benny, they had become good friends, mostly by a constant stream of letters. In 1977, she went into the Carmelite Monastery in San Rafael and she lasted less than six months. In the meantime, Ed was talking with his friend Ben about being gay. He told him that he'd seen a shrink. He didn't say the shrink ever said getting married was a good idea. He just was telling him that he'd spoken to a shrink. Ben shocked Ed by telling him the same thing. He said men like Ed had been getting married forever. Takes away the gay urges, he said. He said marrying Benny would be the best thing Ed could do. So, Ed continues and he decides he's going to ask Benny to marry him. He listens to the advice of Ben and he thinks, yes, this is what I'll do. I'll ask her to marry me. Now, before the marriage proposal happens, Ed is very honest with Benny and he tells her about a crush that he has on a guy that he's working with. Benny listens to this and when he proposes she says that she would need to sleep on it. The next day Benny says yes. Later in the process, I ask Ed some other questions and I get the response from him. Wow, how the fuck did you come up with these questions? These are fucking dangerous. <laughs> Ed is writing the next part in his den. He's home alone, except for the dogs. There is total silence in the house. Ed writes, In 1995... Benny told me that I had to leave the house and get on with my gay life. By this point, they had their four daughters. He says, I didn't want to go, but she insisted. Ed moved out to an efficiency apartment in the middle of DC's, as he calls it, Gaberhood DuPont Circle. Ed found that he liked being an out gay man. He says, I lost about £80 in my first year. I had several sexual encounters that were unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. Amazing. For the record, I've never had gay sex after we got married. Except during my point in DuPont Circle. In May... 2000, one of Ed's daughters, who was then using drugs, tried to commit suicide by overdose. Ed says, when I went to see her in the locked hospital ward, 
she begged me to come home. She said that her mother just couldn't handle everything by herself and that she missed me. I decided to go back. Benny agreed and I have been back with the family and celibate since July the 1st, 2000. He then tells me the daughter who attempted suicide developed into a great woman. She runs marathons and she's taking part in two or three extreme marathons. So I ask Ed about his career. So I think he kind of gives me the headlines here. So (laughs) I'll do the same. (laughs) Of his work, I do love this. Ed says, I was a whore. (laughs) Most of the time I hated what I did, but I loved the money. So not long after Ed had got back from Germany, he took a job with the federal government in personnel, or as he reminds me now, it's called human resources. He worked for the government in various roles for the next 40 years. Ed was promoted through the ranks until, by the time him and Benny had had the twin daughters, he was at the top of the civil per service pay system, and the money was good. But the work, for the most part, he says, sucked. Ed had started this with the US Navy as a civil service employee in August 1970. He worked in personnel at the Marine Corps base in Virginia. He worked as part of the personnel responsible for civilian employee benefits, discipline, grievances, appeals, training and labour relations. In November 1971, he moved to Navy headquarters in Virginia, right next to the Pentagon. He was head of the branch of personnel office there that dealt with benefits, grievances, appeals and disciplines. I feel like when Ed is writing this to me, I feel like he's trying to not sort of tell me. I think I feel like he's not trying to not boast about it. But actually, these are fucking great jobs. Like, Ed's actually properly had, like, fantastic, fantastic positions there. Like, really fantastic. I sort of don't want to read it to you a bit like it's a list of a list of stuff that's, you know, just like I'm reading someone's CV. Because actually these things are to be celebrated, but Ed's not really giving me the information here because I think he's trying to be a bit coy about it. In June 1976, he moved to a Department of Defence secure facility 25 miles west of the Pentagon. He was the personnel director there. In November 1982, Ed became director of personnel for the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. He worked with nurses to establish and accredit the nursing programmes and eventually to build their own building on the campus. He retired for good on June the 1st, 2010, 10 weeks short of 40 years of service. Ed, you're a bloody hard worker. Like, don't, like, you know, I feel like you've given me that in a couple of sentences. You know fine well. That's a fucking amazing career. I ask Ed to tell me about love and romance and he says I had one huge romance in my life a relationship that included love sex and friendship it was with a guy named Tom Drexler he was beautiful physically and in his personality he and I worked together on a project for the Navy I thought at first he was useless on the project because he spoke so seldom. The project manager assigned the two of us to go to Norfolk, Virginia to conduct a survey at the naval base. Tom and I rode down together. We spent two weeks in Norfolk and we returned home as a gay couple. But obviously, 
closeted. Ed reminds me, this was 1973. He says, he and I had so much in common, including our reluctance to admit to anyone, including one another, that we were gay. After a while, that changed. And Tom made the first move in their sexual relationship. And Ed says he taught me a lot in that department. He was so naive. Tom ended the relationship in January 1977 because he said he was getting way too emotionally and financially dependent on Ed. He moved to Seattle to work at the naval base. Ed says, I played the organ for his wedding. I still love the guy, but we communicate only by messages on our phone. Before the days of our phones, we didn't communicate at all, except Christmas. I ask Ed, what inspires you? Hey, Barry, this is Ed Hawkins. I'm going to do what you, as you asked and, and read the list of uh, people that inspired me. Um, I wish that I had time to explain why. But you didn't ask for why, and if I were to explain each one, it would probably take at least two hours. So um, I'm just going to read them. Okay, the people who inspire me in my life, Jesus, St. Francis of Assisi, because I was and still am spiritually a Franciscan, President John F. Kennedy got me going on politics and public action and community service, Winston Churchill his gift was inspiration. That's what that man did better than anything else. His use of the English language, his knowledge of history, his uh, knowledge of the classics. He's, I just admired him, and he has inspired me throughout my life. I just really think the world of him. Archbishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa, because of his um, fearlessness in confronting those in power, and also because of his support for gay and women's rights. Uh, my four daughters, each for a different reason, but they all make me, they all inspire me in one way or another. Uh, they're terrific, and I love them. Uh, Nelson Mandela, because of his uh, fearlessness, his, uh, his uh, reconciliation commission, his um, ability to go through personal tragedy like the divorce and all that stuff, and still maintain that focus on what it was he wanted to do for his country and for his and for the um, post for the latter part of his uh, his career you know keeping things going and going in the right direction sorry i just had this guy uh, my one of my daughters came in and i had to explain what i'm doing anyway the next one is Phil Petruccio. Uh, Philip was um, a friend that I didn't know was gay until he got sick. And I had the privilege of being with him as he died. Um, his, um, I don't it's hard to talk about him. It was, his, um, his thing was, uh, his influence on me, I think, was... Uh, his love, I hate to, well, I have to say it, his, his love of sex. Uh, he, he taught me so much about being, allowing myself to be more sensual. He was, uh, he, he, I, I, I'm afraid that it's going to sound like he was some kind of, you know, uh, sex-obsessed person. He wasn't. He just fully and totally accepted the sexual part of his personality and his being. And uh, he really taught me a lot about that. And he was very, very brutal in his teaching, I'll have to tell you. Uh, he never minced words. And I, for all of that, uh, I'm inspired. By all of that, I'm inspired. Sister M. Louis Gonzanag, she was my seventh grade teacher. Uh, she probably had as much to do with my life going in the direction it did as anybody. And uh, in the, the good directions, she, she made me love uh, learning 
uh, she really inspired me to um, not to you know to go for more than I thought I could do. She had so much trust in me. She believed in me more than I believed in myself. We were in contact uh, uh, for years until I left the seminary. And until the day I left, her advice and her counsel to me always was, don't be afraid. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And I can't tell you how many times I relied on that to get myself through uh, various things that I had to get through. Sorry it took so long. Um, you probably won't use it, but that's okay. You can cut out all the bullshit. I ask Ed, what's the bravest decision you have ever made? He says, leaving the friars. It took me too long to realise I wasn't meant to be there, and it took even longer to get over leaving. After I left, I had recurring dreams about being back with the friars. I'd wake up feeling so elated only to have the terrible realisation that it was only a dream. As Ed writes, he is in the dog park and in his headphones he's listening to Mozart. I say to Ed, your daughters, are you close to them? He says, I'm very close to all four. They are amazing people and I love them more than anyone or anything. They all talk to me. They tell me when I'm wrong. They ask me for my opinion. I also increasingly rely on them for advice and for perspective. Their experience of life is so different to mine. And I love hearing them have opinions. And so the process of questions and answers is coming to an end. And so Ed and I are having some correspondence. We talk about the process. We talk about the the crazy thing I've asked him to do, to open yourself up, to share your story. And it's it's often surprising, I think, when someone asks you to, to tell you about themselves. I think it's a really, yeah, I think it's a really hard thing, you know, you Someone says to you, well, what are you about? What's your story? What's your where do you start? What have you what have you what what can you say? Opening yourself up is really hard. As people we don't really lay our feelings as bare as we would like to think that we do. We like to think we're honest, but we know we're not actually laying bare our truths, our actual our actual real things in life and um and you know we talk about oh i'm really pissed off with this fucking person that i'm working with or i'm really this relative has done something or said something or whatever you know but we don't actually really just allow ourselves to actually just talk about what's actually really going on so ed has allowed me the most incredible information and honesty about himself and as our Email communications are coming to an end. We have a moment where we talk about, over email, we talk about where is Ed's information going? Where is, who, is there, is there anybody else who could possibly be ever seeing the things that Ed has ever sent me? I reassure him that absolutely in no way in no way. So to go back to that email that his friend sent him, nobody has ever seen the things that Ed has sent me. And I, I've i taken things out of this story in the way that I've told you it. I've taken things out because I, I feel like Ed laid himself so bare with so many things that I just, there's a couple of bits, I've just taken them out. And that's, and that's been my decision. So, during this process, we have a bit of a back and forth, and it's the very first time that Ed and I have any kind of confrontation about anything, because I think he becomes concerned that his information isn't entirely with me, that maybe other people are seeing it, and I go back to him and I reassure him 100% that I would never disrespect anybody in any way and share 
that information with anybody else. And he replies to me and he says this. Barry, I have an aphorism hanging on my wall right in front of me as I type this. Honesty is intimacy. For me, my relationship with you has been very intimate. You know more about me than any of my friends and more about me than anybody in my family except Benny. I've told you in varying degrees of detail almost everything. As I've written several times, this intimacy with you has made me happy on so many levels. One level that I haven't discussed is perspective. The perspective this writing has given me. Often I've felt like a failure. Oh of the things that have been whirling around my head in the past 30 years, I've moved past most of them. What this process with you has done is made me see that I've lived the life that I chose and all in all, I've been okay at it. That is huge for me and it has lightened my heart as I move down into the final part of my life. I am indebted to you in ways that you probably can't understand now, but ways that you may understand in 30 or 40 years. He signs off by saying, Make me an episode, don't make me an episode. Es macht nicht, which is German and I think translates as It doesn't matter. He finishes the email by saying, Regardless, you have an old gay queen squarely in your corner. (laughs) I ask Ed, What advice would you give to a 37-year-old living in 2017? And he says, That's a hard one. Be kind to yourself. Never hesitate to forgive yourself the mistakes that all of us make. Give yourself the benefit of the doubt. If you have someone to love, let yourself be loved and never allow yourself to doubt that you're worthy of that love, even if the love ends. If possible, work in a field that you love and get paid to follow your passion. I ask Ed, What was your biggest heartbreak? And he says, Waking up in Rome on me and Benny's wedding trip and realising what I had done. I ask, Is Ed in a nutshell even a possibility? His answer is, Something like a screwed up old man who's blessed to have a wonderful family and more good friends than he thought possible when he was younger. As Ed writes the answer to the final question I ask him, he's in his backyard on a sunny day. A concert version of West Side Story is playing in the background. The last question I ask Ed is, Ed, have you any regrets? The last question I ask Ed is, Ed, have you any regrets? He says, too many to count. Some days I feel like I failed life. Other days I feel like I've passed. I rely on on the Lord's mercy. And so ends the story of Ed Hawkins.
Bye.